it's about November at this point in the year, and we're starting to launch into operations and algebraic thinking. And that's a strand of math that's really going to help them in middle school and help them apply everything we've learned in base 10 to using fractions and decimals and all sorts of other things. So it's really important that they understand patterning in numbers with operations and algebraic thinking. It's kind of teaching them that the verbs of math are the operations that we use and algebraic thinking is thinking about the number sentences that we use to talk about different formulas. Um, they've been doing this since kindergarten, but they don't usually think about the patterns in numbers and connect it to their understanding of rules or truths that they could then say, I know that I can always use this formula for this situation. Um, in kindergarten, what operations and algebraic thinking looked like was usually a circle, circle, star, what comes next, circle, circle. Um, that was how simple they kept it in kindergarten. In first grade, they launched into operations and algebraic thinking using numbers. They would do the same thing, but they would teach a pattern of numbers and a sequence. And then second grade rolled around and they started combining operations with these numbers. And that's where they start talking about fact families. They'll say two plus four equals six, six, hmm, something, four equals two. Hmm, what operation might that be? that would help me understand the relationship between these numbers and the rule. So you're kind of trying to get them to think about rules and think about patterns and start to understand that algebra is something we use to talk about what, how we're using those numbers. So I really wanna make sure I'm emphasizing that algebra and operations is something they've been doing since kindergarten and so I tell the kids these kinds of reviews of what it looked like in lower grades, and then they understand. The first one we're covering is operations and algebraic thinking one. And that is understanding that and explaining um, how you can compare multiplication equations. So they just take this one operation of multiplication and they say, how can you use that to compare it to another multiplication problem? So if I were to take something like seven times three, how can I compare that? Well, the first thing you need to do is be able to talk about it many, many, many different ways. And that way it's, it's solid. It's not just understanding the pattern because you've memorized a rule, that's something we did when we were younger, is really important now that they understand that the rule is there because it actually follows something that is true all the time. So we usually start with making an array and we'll say there's two ways that I can express this relationship. I can say that I have seven, three, four, five, six, seven columns, and I have three rows. That's one way to think of it. The other way to think of it is if I were to flip this on its side, it would then be three columns and seven rows. And really getting them to visualize that is really important. Also, if I were counting on a number line and my goal was to reach 21, how could I count it? Well, there's two ways. I could either count it by threes or I could count it by sevens. and both would get me 21, 
and showing the relationship between these two really important. Um, now you can see that I didn't get it exact and I would want the kids to talk about that. I would want them to say, so why? Why am I, what's the error in my picture here? And again, we don't hide mistakes. Mistakes are a great opportunity for you to talk about truth. Scientists and mathematicians talk about when is a rule proof? Where's your proof? Where is a rule true? So that's why it's really important on a number line to denote amounts. So if this were three, then the tick marks would be here. And that really shows my error. And then I would show them the error and help them discuss that. That deepens their understanding. Um, when they get to fifth grade, they will talk more about the use of parentheses. We introduce parentheses in fourth grade. So in fourth grade, there's many ways we could break down this problem. We could say seven times three. We could also say three plus Four is another way to express seven times three. And we could do that, or we could do two plus one times seven. And that's another way to express it. Um, they are exposed to this in fourth, and it gets way, way deeper in fifth, and that's why it's really important that they have this foundational understanding. The last way is to use words. So if I were to write this as a word way, word description, how would I say it? I might say um, there's seven times as many threes in that number. And writing that as words what are the different ways that I could describe that? I could say seven times as many, and you really want to connect that so that the next skill that they're learning, operations and algebraic thinking too, in word problems, makes sense to them. Seven times as many threes. How could I write that? Or three times as many sevens and talk about the different ways that we describe this in word problems. Okay. And that's operations and algebraic thinking one. Once they understand the basics of how to give proof for multiplication problems in operations and algebraic thinking one, then we launch into real world applications of operations and algebraic thinking, which is proving multiplication problems using word problems, which is operations and algebraic thinking too. And that's word problems. This is usually one of the ones where children will come to their parents the most and ask for assistance. Please, please, please on these, I'm perfectly happy with parents helping, but make sure you're helping after they've shown their work, not before. Um, even if they attempt the problem and give an explanation and come up with a solution that's not correct, that's better than if they come to you with a blank page and you walk them through it. A little bit of struggle will not only help them to build their skills and their tolerance for frustration, but it will also give you something to talk about with your child so that you can help them through the word problem. So please, please, please make sure when you do these, ask them, underline all the key information. Once they've underlined all the key information, then ask them to show a picture of it. And then once they draw a picture of it, ask them to try and make sense of it. So let's say we have a word problem. So the first thing you wanna do is explain to them that there's a math word in here. So what's the math word? And the math word in this problem is times. And then the other math word is six miles. And then as far is relating 
the brother to the sister. So the two things that I have the students do is first label what the numbers represent. Brother represents five times Sarah. And Sarah is five miles from where you are now. Okay? So now the next part is make sure you're answering the question that was asked. The question here would be, um, how far does the brother live from here? The question would be, how far does the brother live? So, if I know that Sarah is five, then the brother has to be five times more. So then you write an equation but I would ask the students not to derive an equation until they drew a picture of it. And since we've talked about in operations and algebraic form the many ways you can represent the picture, I would say, well, does it make sense on this problem to draw the problem, a picture of it as an array? Um, no, because miles aren't usually listed in square units. Okay, so what would be a good way to draw a picture of it? A number line. So, if I were to draw a number line and say the start of the number line represents we're here and the end of the number line represents where uh, I wouldn't say where Sarah lives because the brother is going to be five times more so we're going to say the end of the line represents where the brother lives and we know that we're going to count the brother as five times, so we know it's going to be five of these, one, two, three, four, five. And we know that it's five times Sarah. So we know each one of these represents five, two, three, four, and five. So this is five miles, and this is five miles, and this is five, and this is five. And this is five. And so how far does the brother live? Well, now I skip count by fives. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 25 miles away. Away is the answer to the question. The other thing that's really important with operations and algebraic thinking too is that they explain the answer in logical terms. Don't just give the solution, but tell me what the solution means. So it's not 25, it's 25 miles away. That's the answer to the question. And hopefully you can see that it's why it's really important to draw the picture, not the equation first. The picture helps them understand the concept. The equation then kind of grounds that and solidifies it. So now I would write the equation. Um, brother is, B is five times S, and S is equal to five. So you do want them to be able to understand how to talk about algebra, but that's the last of what's important. The really important part is for them to understand conceptually what these numbers represent. So the next skill is operations and algebraic thinking three. And this is where we use subtraction to talk about word problems and patterning. And this one is deceivingly difficult to use because students are used to thinking about subtraction as real objects. And so when they see a word problem and it involves subtraction, they can usually show me the answer in an equation, but if I ask them to show me proof on a number line or in a picture, that's really challenging and that's really where the conceptual understanding is. So first, before I even begin to tackle this one, I need to explain that in the classroom, I'm rarely up at the front board 
showing students how this one is done. Usually they're attempting to draw pictures of it and I'm looking at the many, many different ways that they show the problems. Then we use their work to show it. It's messy, it's not neat, but it's conceptually strong and it's really important that they see and use the many different ways to think about and struggle with these different problems. So if it looks messy while I'm showing it to you and it looks kind of confusing, that's where the real thinking is, where they are struggling with it and thinking about it. So for this problem, we have a movie theater that holds 203 seats. And on opening night, all the seats were used but 19. Now that's part of the problem. Then there's a second part. If eight people sit in each row, how many rows of seats were used? I love the fact that the second part of the equation asks for something completely different than the first part because you always want students to stop and think, wait a minute, what, what in the real world is being asked of me? Not what is the answer, but what in the real world is being asked? So they need to get used to slowing down enough to think about that. So how can we think about this? I know that we were trained when we were young to immediately jump to, I would say, oh, I just subtract the number of seats from the number of seats that are possible. But I would discourage that because again, they need practice showing their work and their thinking in many different ways. In this case, I would start with a number line. The number line's going to be messy and the number line's going to look a little different depending on which student is struggling with it. But the struggle is where the real learning happens. So for this, we start by saying our number line starts here and it goes to here and it represents all 203 seats. Now there's a few ways we could show the 19 seats that are missing. We could say, well, it represents a block of seats that are empty, minus 19. Another way we could show it is skip counting. We could say, we're missing five, we're missing 10, we're missing 15, we're missing 19 seats. This would probably be easier to subtract from our 203. Um, I would probably ask the students to try and keep track of their work somehow because on the number line the first time out it's going to look very, very messy. So if a kid were subtracting they would probably start by saying, well I want to take away the three. So if I took three away from this four, three seats, and I would fill them, then that would still leave me with one seat. And I subtracted three, and that left me with 200 seats left over that are still filled. And then one more seat, I'm not gonna take away yet because that would bring me to a messy number, but could I take 10 away? Yeah. Ten filled. Ten seats were filled, just like these. And that left me with 190 seats. And then I take away another five seats. And that leaves me with 185 seats. And how many seats do I still have? Well, I'm still missing one more seat that I have to fill, minus the one. And that would leave me with 184 seats. Now, how would I prove it? Well, 
this is where I know this work looks really messy and I could have done it easily and simply by saying 203 minus 19. I mean, this is how we would have done it. But that does not show me they understand what's really happening. And unfortunately, our number line doesn't either because it's too messy. But then if I ask the kids, well, could you, now that you've done it and you've tried to do it on the number line, could you show this work meter on the number line? They usually can, especially as a team. So if I ask them, okay, so now that we know what it is and we know how you subtracted it, could you show that neatly? And they would probably draw something like this. Well, I had 100 seats filled. And I had had three seats empty. And then I had another 10 seats empty. And then I had another five seats empty. And finally, I had one seat empty. And that equaled the 19. And these were empty seats. And so how many seats do I still have that are full? Well, I had 203, so I had 50 that were full here. And 30. Full. And then I have four. And do they equal 203 total? And then I would ask them to add all of this up. So some of them will naturally do bars. Some of them will naturally do number lines. Um, and then they see the relationship between those two. Um, I'm doing it on bars here because I have limited space and I want to make sure you're seeing the messiness of it and the thinking part of it and the playing with it part of it. Getting the answer less important than being able to be comfortable playing with it. So now am I done? No, I'm not because the number line helped me to think about it in a different way than I'm used to. But what about the answer to the question that's being asked? For this particular word problem, there's a lot going on. And I know that parents will immediately want to do this, the computational work. But if you do, your children will at that point say, great, I have the answer. I'm done. Um, you want them to struggle and play with it and work with it some. So please, please, please don't just jump to computation. You want them to mess with it. So let's say, okay, I'm trying to draw 203 seats. So the best way to do that would probably be to draw a line. So I'm going to draw a nice big line at the bottom And I'm going to say, okay, let this line represent 203 possible holds 203. That's what it holds. And on the night that they were there, there were all the seats full except for 19. So how can I draw that? All the seats full, and this represents what we don't know, and 19 
on this number line, empty. So we know 19 are empty. We know these are full. So how can we find out, out of the 203, how many were empty? Well, the difference is 184, but how can I prove it in a picture or in another way? Well, I could say, well, I know that of these seats that are full, at least 100 of these red ones represent seats that are full. That brings me to 119. That's one way I could do it so far. And I'm keeping track of my total. 100 plus the 19 that are empty gets me close. And if I added another 50 seats to this, That would get me closer to my 203 total. And if I added one, that would get me a nice round number, 170. Now I can see how much closer I am to 203. So if I add another 30 seats, That gets me to 200. And then this must be the three seats. Let me put that one up here, plus three. So now I know this rep 19 was here. Those are the empty seats. So this represents all the seats that are full. So three and 100 and 50, there it is, the 100, the 3, the 50, the 1, and the 30. And all together, those will get me my 184. You can see how messy this is. This is exactly the kind of work you would see in a classroom. This is one way of drawing a picture of it and explaining your thinking. There's many, many, many ways to show your thinking in a picture. All of them are more useful and deeper conceptual understanding than just the computation. So they really do need the extra practice struggling with it. And you can help them with the computation but as long as they also can draw the picture on their own, that's great, but you really want to make sure that they can draw it many, many, many different ways. We're almost done. We now need to ask, well, how can I draw a picture of the question that's being asked? So now that we have a picture proof of how to get 184, how can I also make sure I'm answering the question that's being asked if eight people sit in each row, how many rows of seats were used? Now I need to take that 184 and I need to block it into rows of eight. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take a nice easy bunch of rows. This is a row. And we have eight in each row. And how many times do we have that? Uh, let's say for starters, we're going to do 10. And this is 80 rows. And that's close, but now we need more. So let's do another 80 rows. And that would be another 10 rows. That gets me up to uh, 20 rows and 160 total. So since each row 
holds eight, and we're trying to put them in rows of eight, then we can say, if I have a row with eight in it, and I have that eight times, how many people do I have? I have 80 people. 80 rows, or I'm sorry, eight rows 10 times equals 80 people. And then if I were to do that again, I would say I have 160 people. And that gives me 160 seats. And then I have 34 seats or 24 seats left over. I know that means I have eight three more times would get me the 24 people. So now I know I need 23 rows to fit all of the people that I, ready? Mm -hmm. So since each row holds eight, and we're trying to put them in rows of eight, then we can say, if I have a row with eight in it, and I have that eight times, how many people do I have? I have 80 people. 80 rows, or I'm sorry, eight rows 10 times equals 80 people. And then if I were to do that again, I would say I have 160 people. And that gives me 160 seats. And then I have 34 seats or 24 seats left over. I know that means I have eight three more times would get me the 24 people. So now I know I need 23 rows to fit all of the people that I need to make sure that those seats were used. 23 rows. Okay. Ready? Mm -hmm. So since each row holds eight and we're trying to put them in rows of eight, then we can say, if I have a row with eight in it, and I have that eight times, how many people do I have? I have 80 people. 80 rows, or I'm sorry, eight rows 10 times equals 80 people. And then if I were to do that again, I would say I have 160 people. And that gives me 160 seats. And then I have 34 seats or 24 seats left over. I know that means I have eight three more times would get me the 24 people. So now I know I need 23 rows to fit all of the people that I need to make sure that those seats were used. 23 rows.
need to make sure that those seats were used. 23 rows. I would love to tell you that that's where operations and algebraic thinking three ends, but it's really an extension of all four operations, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction, using more than one step. So I think you can see how frustrating it is just dealing with the subtraction element of OA3. That's why the students have to be comfortable dealing with it many different ways and showing it many different ways and talking about it using many different ways. So an example of another problem that they might come across that's very similar, but the picture would look very different. And now you can see that that's one step to the problem. These are multi-step problems. I think you can also see, okay, so this would be subtraction, 27 minus what I give Miss Beginus, but I'm not done there. Then I have this other part where I have to take whatever's left over. And then I have to divide that among four teachers. And then the question that's being asked is how many pens are left over? So what I usually do on a problem like this is ask the students to put the problem into steps. Step one would be give Miss Beginus 13. How could I draw a picture of that? Well, if I have 27 pens and I give Miss Beginus 10 and 3, What's the difference between what Miss Beginus was given and what I have? Well, four more would be seven. And then that brings me up to 17 and 10 more would be 14. So this is the part that I get to keep. And this part goes to Miss Beginus. So I have 14 pens left over after the first step, which is to give to Miss Beginus. Step one. Give to Miss Beginus, to Miss B. What would be step two? Divide among the four teachers. And again, really important for them to draw pictures of it. So I would use the same model. I would say I'm going to start by saying I have 14 pens left over. If I group in fours, four teachers, and I gave each teacher one pen, how many pens would I group them in? Well, three, four, one, two, three, four. Then give them another pen each, five, six, seven, eight, then give them another pen each. Nine, 10, 11, 12. Can I give them any more pens? No. So I gave 12 pens total and I kept track. I could count again just to double check my work or I could skip count. Three plus three is six, plus three is nine, plus three is 12. I gave 12 away. How many do I have left over? I have two left over. Okay. Now, 
Um, that's what it's asking. It's not asking how many did each teacher receive. Each teacher received three pens. It's asking how much was left over. Two pens left. So hopefully you can see why drawing many different models, being able to draw many different pictures of it, helps you understand the division operations and the multiplication operations and even the adding operations more effectively. So we're now at about the end of December, January, usually January, and I'm launching into Operations and Algebraic Thinking 4, which is factors and using multiplication in ways that students aren't used to thinking about multiplication. So they've done fact families in second grade where they learned three times two was also the same product as two times three. But now I want to teach them the patterning of factoring in pairs. And we usually start to do that by making a factor rainbow. And every fourth grader thinks there's a shortcut to making factor rainbows. There isn't. So they really just need to learn that you have to know your multiplication facts and you have to just methodically go through all the factor combinations halfway to the product of the number. Because as we know on a multiplication grid, the one side of the grid is the exact opposite fact of the other side of the grid. So you really only need to know half of your multiplication chart to know all of your factors. You just reverse them at that point. So it's the same with factor rainbows. So if you take a number like 56 and you make it into a factor rainbow, you say my rainbow starts at 56. And we don't talk about zero because zero is a special number that you'll learn a lot about in middle school. But when we're talking about factors, we stay away from zero, we stay away from uh, two, because two is also a complicated one. But we still write them on our factor board. So our first fact would be always one times 56. That's a true fact. The next one we would look at is the next step on our factor rainbow, two. Can two times something be multiplied to get 56? Yes. That's uh, 28, because 25 and 25 is 50, and 3 and 3 is 6, so 25 and 3 is 28. And you really want to slow down enough to give the kids time to think about that. 3, 3 times something, will that get me 56? Most fourth graders don't know their facts up to three facts up to 56. So you really have to get them to do the work off to the side of, well, if you divide three into 56, and we have done Dracula's mother sucks chicken blood quite a bit at this point. So all the students know how to use Dracula's mother sucks chicken blood to do this problem. So they would say, I'm gonna suck out 10 threes from 56. And they do usually know that there's eight threes in 26. So they now know that this number cannot go evenly into three but there's really no shortcut to doing that. So you have to get them to show it off to the side. Um, if they do say, no, but I know it doesn't, ask them how, and if they can't tell you then, they really need to give evidence. Four times something, will that get me in? Yes. And if they usually don't know their four facts up to this either, so I would still have them do it off to the side, but it really doesn't take that long. 
proof. So 14 and 4 is your next fact. We need to get it to 28. Or I'm sorry, to yeah, to 28 to know that we have all our facts there. So 4 is not there. 5, um, no, because it's not a multiple of 5. 6, that's when they do start knowing their facts. So 6 times um, 9 is 54, so they know it can't be 56. And then 7, 7 times 8, they know that fact usually. 9 or 8, we, that's the reverse fact. So now that you have the reverse fact on there, you know you're done. And then the last step is to put their facts in order. So the factors of 56 are 1, 2, 4, 7, 8, 14, 28, and 56. So still on operations and algebraic thinking for We've shown how to make a factor rainbow, <coughs> but in fifth grade, they're going to need to know how to make a factor tree. And the reason they're going to need to know how to make a factor tree is because they play a lot with prime factors and composite or prime factors in fifth grade. So kids need to know the difference between prime and composite numbers and factoring lends itself to that. So as I, I'm sure you're aware, prime numbers are any number where the factors of that number are one and itself, and those are the only factors. And there's no easy way to find those except making a factor tree or a factor rainbow. Composite numbers are all the numbers that are not prime. So if I were to take a very simple one, and I usually start with a simple one in factor trees, like 12, and I were to say, well, this number is 12, and if I were to bring this tree down and do it as a tree of branches going down, down, down like roots, then I would start my tree with 1 times 12, could I make a different root using a different factor? Yes, because this is not a prime number. One is prime, but dude, that is not. It has more factors than one in itself. So two times six, that gets me closer to just prime numbers. That's a prime number. And two, the only factors are one and itself. Could I bring this one down and make it smaller? Yeah, I could say two times three. That's a prime number and that's a prime number. Now, I could make my factor tree branch off in other ways. I could say three times four and then two times two, that one brings it down to its roots. But the really cool thing about factor trees is that you can see that when you bring a tree down to its prime roots, these are all prime numbers and they're at the roots of the tree. You can't go lower than that. One times that number is how low you can go. What's really cool is you can multiply these back together and they will always get you that number. So three times two is six, six times two is 12, 12 times one is still 12, okay? So getting them to play with factor trees helps prepare them for their fifth grade expectation of prime factorization.